Hey guys, welcome back. It's Chris Bircher, and this is Knowledge Plus Experience Equals Wisdom, and we're continuing with the acid test. And this week, I'm going to go over kind of an example of something that's uh, really important to me, and that's the idea of cooperation versus competition in nature. And I think this is like episode 109. I get this wrong every week, but you know, it doesn't matter. This one's about competition and cooperation. And so in an effort to provide an example of where we can look to nature to sort of resolve some conflicts, right? Or help us make decisions about whether or not we're doing something right or we're going in the wrong, right direction. Or if as humans, we're making good decisions or sort of, you know, just sort of assess how we're doing uh, and get at, uh, at the bigger questions like, why am I here? What's my purpose? What are our values? Um, what, are, what are we supposed to do with our, with our planet? Um, are we supposed to be responsible or are we supposed to use it you know, to, as we see fit. It's kind of like I always heard in the Bible. The Bible describes um, God as putting all the animals on earth for man's benefit, for human's benefit. And I always thought that was kind of crazy. You know, it's like, really? They're just like these inan inanimate objects that were put here just to feed us or for us to exploit? That seems kind of weird. Uh, but okay. Um, maybe we'll discuss that one in an upcoming episode. So my master's thesis, when I got to master school, you know, you, you do a project, you learn to be like a little budding scientist and generally your major professor, your advisor or whomever helps you sort of come up with a testable question. They don't want you just floundering around because you would kind of want to do it in a couple of years in, in the hard sciences and you want to like ask a question and do all the research, but it's not, you know, it's important that you come to some conclusion. For example, I had, I advised a graduate student one time who studied hellbenders, these giant salamanders that live in the United States, freshwater salamanders, one of the biggest salamanders in the world. There's also a similar species in Japan that's a little bigger. That doesn't matter. But they're super rare. So in his entire tenure as a getting his master's degree at this college, I think he was there for almost three years, he only found like five. And that's just not enough. And then I had another friend who, um, or colleague, when I was getting my master's, who was studying flying squirrels in forests of West Virginia, both of these incidentally in West Virginia, and I don't think he ever found any. And he had to change his whole idea after like a couple of years. So, you know, you get some help. You don't, you're not completely on your own here. You're not a scientist yet when you're doing your master's. And so my advisor had a kind of a catalog of interesting questions he had, you know, accumulated over the years in his tenure from a study spot. And one of them was, um, this idea of how similar species coexist. And in this one particular stream he had studied for his whole career, there were five or six, I don't remember, species of dragonfly larvae. You know, dragonflies, when they're babies, when they're nymphs, they live in the water before they're, and, and they lay their eggs in water and they're born in the water and then they emerge as adults and live in the terrestrial environment. You may not have known that. Uh, secret aside, I used to be kind of a dragonfly expert. That in the quarter will get you a hot cup of jack squat. Uh, and so the interesting question was, these are all top level predators in a insect community in small streams. And so on one hand, the sort of food web theory would say that there's only one apex predator, right? And in this case, it might've been fish, you know, so it's arguable. There's several layers and it's a little confusing and it's nebulous and we don't really know, but you know, in this case, wouldn't there be only like room for one of these knit, very specific food niches, right? And so the theory is that they must coexist through some other mechanism. They must um, not, you know, reduce competition or else they would compete to the point where only one species would be left. That whole survival of the fittest that actually wasn't any part of Darwin's theory of evolution or natural selection, right? Survival of the fittest is something we made up with words because it sounded like what was going on, but it wasn't. Now, fitness is part of it. So theoretically, one of these seven predators or whatever that are very close in all characteristics, um, would be competing in the fittest one, whether it was the biggest one or the one with the biggest mouth or the one that had poison darts, you know, would be the fittest. And then therefore it would be the one to survive. The opposite or the, the other sort of hypotheses are that, well, perhaps they don't actually compete through some other mechanism because, hey, food is just one of the resources they need, right? And so I set out to do a study that said, 
that it analyzed, you know, was looking at that second hypothesis that they must coexist probably through this theoretical mechanism called resource partitioning, where you took all the resources they need, well, of which food is just one, and sort of said, all right, well, how do they compete or not compete or share or not share all these other resources? And the main resources now, okay, so this this is a cool question. It doesn't sound like a big deal, but it gets at the whole concept of speciation and diversity. And it employs my favorite um, acid, deoxyribonucleic acid, as being the mechanism through which this speciation can occur. So on the one hand, if you're into biodiversity, and arguably biodiversity is important because it is a byproduct of evolution in this DNA mechanism we have. One of the things that DNA and sexual reproduction and adaptation lead to is a whole lot of different kinds of species. And what that leads to is redundancy. And so if one thing changes, like the temperature drops 10 degrees globally all of a sudden overnight, well, you've got tons of different species, all with varying degrees of capacity to make the adjustments to those temperature changes. Some of them won't, but a whole bunch of them will. And so biodiversity is redundancy in perpetuity, right? So if you've got a whole lot of different choices and something bad happens, chances are you're going to be able to deal with it because you have so many different choices. Now, if evolution instead took the route that many people think it does toward one perfect benevolent organism, humans, and they were all that was left because we ate all the animals and we exploited them like the Bible tells us to or whatever, and then something bad happens, we're gone. One of the questions I missed on my dissertation defense years later was why is biodiversity important? And all I could come up with was because we value species. We like dolphins. We like lots of fishes. We like butterflies. Uh, right? Well, not at all. The why biodiversity is important is to support genetic diversity. Having lots of genes means you have a massive toolbox to deal with change. You need organisms to m retain genes and express genes in order for them to persist in a population via natural selection. If you got a bunch of genes hanging out in, in, in certain organisms that are weird and you kill all those things because they taste good, those genes could be lost. They will no longer be part of the gene pool. And this gets to so many different things. I don't even remember where I left off and made all these tangents, but another sort of element uh, of all this is the whole idea of junk DNA. You know, it's possible that every organism carries all the genes for everything that ever happened throughout history. And it's all hidden in what we call junk DNA because we don't know what it does. I don't think that's true um, because biodiversity is sort of an artifact of natural selection. And if every individual could carry the blueprints to all different kinds of life, then biodiversity wouldn't be selected for. Okay. Okay. So, you know, the idea of resource partitioning was my thesis approach. And I would say, okay, I'm going to come up with a list of important resources. Now, this is what I was getting at. The definition of a species is, you know, one that reproduces only with itself and not with others. And so part of this is reproductive isolation. Now, if a bunch of different looking thing frogs can all interbreed and have babies that are varying degrees of both, that's not a species. Those are all like subspecies or whatever. You know, until there are isolation mechanisms that prevent the, uh, organisms from having viable offspring with anyone but the same species you're not really a species you're, you know it's some some nebulous um in between thing and so speciation occurs uh because of things like resource partitioning you have to have a mechanism that differentiates you or then there's only there's only ever one species right they don't branch off and so the the the, the sort of Physical expression of what a species is, is the word niche. Each unique species occupies a unique niche. Looking at the dragonflies, if you defined niche simply by what they eat, well, then all dragonflies are the same because they're all predators. So they're all in the same niche. Now, they may have different size mouth parts, kind of like Darwin's finches, and eat different things. Aha! 
Well, that allows them to occupy multiple niches, which will, with the combination of reproductive isolation, lead to a new species. Right? Okay, you follow me? So in order to become a new species, you've got to find your own niche. Now, this is where things get crazy. And this is where my, my thesis had the potential to be something massive and pretty could have been my career if I chose to do it. A niche is defined, or niche. I hate that word. I hate that pronunciation. It sounds so pretentious. But niche, niche, whatever, is defined as, and I love this, one of my favorite, a multi-dimensional hypervolume defined by the resources a species needs, an organism needs to survive. Multi-dimensional hypervolume. And the reason we say multi-dimensional is because we don't know how many dimensions there are. Let's just say there's way more than we can account for. And I learned this lesson the hard way. Food, we already mentioned, is a dimension of a niche. Right? It's a resource that something needs that will define them. If you are a herbivore, well, that sort of narrows down your niche to only eating plants. If you're a predator, that sort of narrows down your niche to only eating living tissue. If you're a decomposer, that narrows down your niche to only eating rotting and dying organic matter. You see what I'm saying? But now you can further divide that. Say you your niche is uh, immature seeds from a, some fruit tree, right? That's what you eat. That's what fits in your mouth. That's what your body can process. That That's going to narrow your niche down pretty specifically to that. But food is just but one resource. There's also space. Where do you live? Do you live on up in the limbs of the trees, like an arboreal, like a chimpanzee or maybe, or some sort of monkey or some snakes or birds? Do you live in the understory, in the soil? Do you live in the ocean? Do you live in, under the ice in the Arctic? You're an algae species that is adapted to live in that sort of environment. So space is a, is a, is a niche. And again, and again, they can be broad. You know, we can be generalists, able to live in a lot of different spaces, able to eat a lot of different things, omnivores. Or a specialist, where you only eat one very, like the seed idea with Darwin's finches. You only can fit a certain kind of seed in your crazy, weird-shaped beak. Which opens directions, you know, generalists, specialists, what's good, what's bad. Well, a lot of specialists is going to be what diversity is. Look at things like peacocks, you know, or flying squirrels. Or, or some of these birds you see with the crazy mating dances. Um, you know, angelfish, like a uh, freshwater angelfish with the lar long, crazy fins. You know, some things are peculiar looking and they're specialized to live in certain environments. And generally these things um, um, are, are, are the first ones to go, if you will, when disasters happen. But not always. Generalists can do lots of things. Think of kudzu. Think of invasive species. Think of the European starling. They're able to live lots of different places. And, and so what do we see them doing? taking over niches and they wipe a bunch of other stuff out. That's what invasive species do. They're better at um, t uh, exploiting resources than other organisms because they can switch around. If this seed runs out, they'll just switch over to this one where if there's an organism that only eats that one seed and it can't eat anything else, it's going to die. And if the starling comes in and eats it all, they're going to kill them. And as we spread animals across the planet, we expose these highly adapted niche specialists to these generalists, and we lose biodiversity in the process. And so species come and go. And so the idea of, um, of resource partitioning is that you a <laughs> nature has provided a mechanism of flexibility. Organisms can move around. You know, the niche is a, is, a, is a hypervolume, right? Think of it like a sphere. Or if you wanted to simplify it, if your niche was defined only by food and space, then you'd have a two-dimensional niche, an X and a Y axis. And the organism can only be located in the two-dimensional space. Add a third dimension to that. Now you can kind of be out here and add a fourth, you know, that, and it gets really complicated. And that's what I was trying to do in my master's thesis is define these Simplify the niche, of course, because I can't do all that. I don't even know what all the dimensions are of time, 
It's time was the third axis for me. Space and food and time. Like they could be active at different times of the year or they could be active at night or during the day and thereby separate themselves in time and space. And space, as an example for the dragonflies, some of them lived on logs and that's the only place they ever lived or twigs. Some of them burrowed in the sand and hardly ever left the sand. Some of them lived on the roots of plants that hung down off the sides of the banks. So they were essentially never encounter each other because they were separated by space. They didn't have any uh, time of day thing, but certainly some of them could have been more active like in the spring or the fall. And, and, and that was part of it. You know, when these things emerged as adults and when they were big and when they were small was different throughout the time of year. So they were definitely partitioning uh, space and time, but not so much food. Well, they did partition food as an artifact of where they lived. The ones that lived in the sand ate stuff that lived in the sand. <laughs> the ones that lived on the wood ate stuff that lived on the wood. They were different, but it wasn't because they were hunting different things, right? So anyway, that's I was able to show how these organisms partition space and time in order to coexist in this stream. But what I realized in the process was to really understand this. One, I needed to know all the other hyper dimensions which is pretty big, uh, probably not doable. Uh, but the other thing that I could, wasn't able to do is to figure out how much of each resource they were using. And in order to do that, I needed to be able to quantify how much of a resource, how much wood, how much sand, how much overhanging roots, how much whatever they were eating is available. And of course, how much time in the sense of what was the capacity. That way I could rank them along a continuum from zero no resource to maximum resource and put them somewhere on that line. Uh, without that kind of measurable quantitativeness, I couldn't actually locate them in the hypervolume, right? I could g g get a general area and say these two are apart, but I couldn't really show where they were, which, you know, that would be the ultimate sort of tech approach to, you know, all species on Earth. Can we take the hypervolume of niche in dimensional niches on the planet and divide it all up. And we would basically show how every species that exists is in a different spot. <laughs> There's no overlap, which was the, the, the null hypothesis of course, for my master's study was that they all overlap and they're all going to kill each other. And so <laughs> it's a long way to go to get at the idea of competition and cooperation in the status quo in journalism, in movies, in the dominant um, um, pop popular culture, in governments, in society, in families, you hear the word competition. We love sports. We love winning. We overemphasize the value of competition. It is enti almost entirely a human construct versus millions of years of evolution in the natural world, it has shown that competition doesn't really exist. Because in order for competition to exist, resources have to be limiting. What I have demonstrated in the pre previous 18 minutes is that there are and there are more, but there's one fundamental mechanism of resource, resource partitioning that is the dominant theme in nature that exists because of DNA, because of natural selection, because the environments change and biology has to respond. I'm making some pretty big leaps, but the, with the because, but as a as, as an, a line of evidence suggests that natural systems will avoid competition, preferring instead more cooperative processes like resource partitioning. And in fact, competition rarely actually exists because of these mechanisms. We make an error when we claim competition is beneficial. What's beneficial is premeditated cooperation to avoid it. That's the argument I'm making. And then this might have to go into a second episode because this is a major claim that you may not have made it far enough in the video to hear. So when we say things like competition drives quality in business, that is 
absolutely unsupported by millions of years of evolution. It is a new idea that only exists in the context of, what do you call it, neo-capitalistic, you know, wealth mongering, right? What, what that kind of competition, what capitalistic competition as defined by humans in this modern era suggests is that there will only be one species left. And in this case, the species isn't humans. It's an aggressive, competitive, um, money hungry, uh, uh, insidiously driven by gluttony and type of individual. Because that's what what that's what, 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 what competition is. Competition exists when an entity wants to take it wants to make resources limiting. You know, the, the in this case, like the 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 Darwin's definition of of healthy capitalism, uh, the argument is uh, that c- capitalism or competition will keep businesses honest. Right. If McDonald's and Burger King are making crappy hamburgers that are making people sick, Wendy's is going to kind of going to come along and sell a better product for a better price. And everybody's going to switch to that. And either McDonald's and Burger King are going to have to step up their game and start to make affordable, healthy hamburgers or they're going to go out of business. So that's the that's the idea. And maybe that does happen sometimes, but it's not how it happens in the natural world. Because the resources that are limiting in in the case of these businesses are artificially limited. They're only limited in as much as each business wants 100% of the pie. No species wants 100% of the pie. That doesn't exist in nature. Like resource hoarding maybe it exists for individuals and in some of the more derived animals, like maybe like dolphins, maybe octopi. But it's going to be on an individual basis. I think if you study primates and, and social other social organisms, you're going to find that that sort of behavior isn't the dominant behavior. It does exist, but the dominant behavior is going to be more cooperative. And so if you don't have a limiting resource, you don't have competition. If there's 15 pizzas on a table and 10 hungry people, no problem. If there's one pizza on a table and there's 10 hungry people, we got a problem. The problem in nature is solved by, well, sharing and cooperative, eating something else, looking somewhere else. You know, the first thing, and I'm anthropomorphizing, and I'm plugging a lot of uh, conjecture here, speculation, but, you know, what would happen in this imaginary scenario is those other nine, you know, those people would say, well, let's split this up evenly and then go look for other food or, or whatever, or perhaps maybe one, the biggest bully is going to eat it, but the other people sort of concede that that there may be their generalists and whatever. That's, I believe that. I believe the idea that competition is healthy is false. And I think it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a primitive, um, concept and even if you bring into the idea of like sports you know sports are fun but when you start to believe that the winning is more valuable than losing leaps and bounds and and start to put all your eggs in those type of baskets you start to miss the point rabid fans have moved past the fun part (laughs) of competitive sports Right. If you can't see losing as being equivalent to winning in those contexts, then you're doing it wrong. Sure, winning feels better than losing, but winning is necessary for the losing. Losing is necessary for the winning. They're two sides of the same coin. The same as it is in nature. You can't avoid that. And so this 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 uh, putting all your eggs in the basket of winning is better and, and winners are win and losers lose and, and any of that sort of language that we've come up with to describe the concept of, of competition is just completely nauseating to me uh, for a lot of different reasons because it brings out the worst in people, in my opinion, because it doesn't do what we say that it does by making, you know, raising all boats or b- bringing up along better quality products. That's not what competition does. Competition does not lead to better quality products. Uh, if it, or if it does, it's a very small part of what it does. I think uh, it would help us 
in this example to look at the natural patterns and how they might inform our values and where we might consider to we might consider that our values may have deviated somehow from a natural condition and then to have the discussion of whether or not we think this is some sort of move in the right direction or perhaps fighting the natural changes that exist. Uh, I hope that's been a decent example. I'm going to revisit it in the past, but that gets it all out there. I know that was a lot more talking about me and a lot less talking about the problem, but I wanted to sort of illustrate the ecological theory of competition, make the point that it rarely, if ever, happens, and that what does happen in nature is much more cooperative, and then deposit the question of why we value competition more in our artificial human system than we do cooperative cooperation, and then deposit the question, and maybe we'll revisit this, this next time, what if we were more cooperative? Especially in the context of the way that resources are becoming more and more limiting. Maybe we'll revisit that last uh, next time. This, I think, has been episode 109, Cooperation versus Competition in Nature. And uh, we'll see you next time. Thanks for your attention. Take it easy.